heads up everybody we are we are recording so okay let me start the slides again sharing content select window or screen anybody's had luck with this that'd be great wow do you see them now You see them now? No, I assume you don't. Like you would the know. sign that says Mallory is starting to share content, but don't see content. Oh, while I'm talking, I'd like to ask everybody to mute their microphone if they're not talking, because we are doing a lot of extra noise. Okay, thank you, Aubrey. I wonder if I can, hmm. So if it's not showing these slides, I'm really not sure what I can, what we can do today. Um, maybe they can be shown by somebody else's screen, or maybe I can try a different browser, but that's pretty key to this day working well. Um, let's see if I can, if I can make another person a presenter, then they can show their own slides, perhaps. Oh, Fenwick, I can see yours. That's cool. What are you What are you seeing right now? Well, I did just see a flash of your slides, but now that's gone. It says I'm doing Fenwick McKelvey's application. There you are. It's back again. I see your whole screen, not just your slides. You can see my uh, children's my desperate attempt to find children's activity on the uh, the Montreal school board at the top. <laughs> no, I can't do that. But I. Oh yeah, why well, you'll never find. Yeah, if you could send me that link afterwards, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> um, okay, is my slides here now? Yeah, I mean, I think you should go. I just wanted to, before we got into it, I was basically done with my whole deal in the beginning, but um, Gershabad has shared the etherpad, which is where we'll be taking notes and where you should put your name down um, as part of the quote unquote blue sheets. It's an attendance tracker. Um, we're recording. If people are on Jabber, I don't know if you are, but it would be great if somebody who's on Jabber already could be our Jabber scribe so that there is um, um, whatever crossover between something that's said in Jabber and here. Although I really, to be honest, do not understand why Jabber is still in use during the virtuals, but nonetheless, um, yeah. that's it. So yeah, Fenwick, you can absolutely take it away. I'd really appreciate that. Oh, is that helpful? I mean, I just was, uh... oh yeah, you're seeing me now, so okay. Yeah, this is so helpful. And Gershavad, I don't know um, if you're able to do the same thing, but we'll get to you when we get to you. Um, but just because, yeah, I clearly cannot use the slide feature right now. So yeah, I'm happy you're here, Fenwick. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, great. And, and I just want to say, you know, thank you all for uh, inviting me, Mallory, especially thanks for inviting me. Um, this is my first time participating at an IERTF or even IETF event. So this is all really new to me. And so it's fascinating. So I just really appreciate you welcoming me into the space and being able to learn. And, uh, you know, hopefully what I tried to do today is, is just connect a little bit about um, my own uh, book project with some of the concerns that are happening today. And hopefully this is interesting. And to me, this is rather mm -hmm. informal. And so if you do have questions, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to, um, you know, digress and talk things through. And um, I think I had about, uh, you know, I think I'll try to go for about 20 minutes and then we can have a discussion. Does that work for everybody? That's great, thank you. And I can see the chat window. So if anybody also wants to put a message in the chat, I am learning rapidly what it's like to virtually facilitate uh, meetings and events um, with my classes and stuff like that. So, um, you know, that's also helpful rather than talking. Um, feel free to um, feel free to put something in the chat. And nice day. And thanks to everyone for joining. It's eight o'clock in the morning here. So I know this is different time zones across the world. So thanks for taking the effort to uh, be here today. I just wanted to begin by talking a little bit about who am I, where am I coming from, 
And, uh, you know, I'm excited to be, you know, part of this, uh, this group. So I'm an associate professor in, at Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec, and I teach in the communication studies field. So um, that my official job title is information and communication technology policy in Canada. There's a typo on the slide here, but um, I really have looked at this kind of consequences of the politics and policy of algorithms and software as or in infrastructure. And so trying to do, I think what's really interesting I'm hearing from Mallory's introduction, that same type of work about translating things that are technical decisions into thinking about them as policy decisions and political decisions. And a lot of my work is really focused in the kind of the other world of internet governance um, in, in <clears throat> media and telecommunications policy. So a lot of looking at how internet regulation works in Canada. And uh, I'm very happy to talk about that in some of my own experiences. You know, I've been really involved, I think probably most recently in a case uh, that Bell Canada is trying to implement um, AI and machine learning to filter spam calls and, and trying to ensure that there's sufficient uh, oversight about that. As well as um, I also helped set our national standards for uh, quality of service as part of the definition of broadband. So standards for latency uh, and packet loss, not so much for jitter, but that was subsequently set. So I can also talk about some of the work about say translating, um, you know, you know, value, ways about what is a good internet connection into actual standard settings. Before I go on, I'm just going to share my, if anybody wants. Putting in the slide, putting in this, these are my slides. I just put it in the chat window. And so talking about my, my book, Internet Demons, Digital Communications Possessed, which is still slightly new. Um, it was published in 2018 on Halloween by University of Minnesota Press, and it's open access. So if anything you're interested and in, you want to read more, um, you can find it online at internetdemons.com. Uh, that's demons with an E. And I'll be talking about a few chapters about this, but the book itself kind of partially tells the history of the invention and development of what I would think of the first infrastructure of the internet, which is the interface message processors, which would you can think of today as, you know, moving from the imps that were designed at ARPANET in the, the late 1960s into the devices and switches and routers that are part of the contemporary internet. And so part of what I've tried to think about is how the design principles and the way that the internet infrastructure developed has continued over time. And what are some of the consequences? And, you know, one of the things I'm proud of about the book is I feel like it tells this, you know, interesting history about routers and switches, but also I think points to the way that the decisions these things make about how, how they deal with issues of uh, bandwidth is being important. And, um, and that, and, and so a central question of the book has been about this idea of what I call flow control. And for people who are of more technical nature, you might understand flow control as a technical term to describe about, um, how much access people uh, flow control is being about uh, how networks can set uh, the amount of bandwidth and the ability of using software to affect the conditions of transmission. And this involves routing and buffering as well as queuing. These types of techniques is part of what I look at as internet demons uh, or as internet routers became more and more intelligent, they became to have more ability of influencing the, the flow control. And I use the term demons because that's something that um, I kind of love, but it also references, I think, the ways that these um, this software was developed and, and this idea that there were these programs running in the background that would be delegating. And so in one sense, it speaks to some of the influences of um, uh, James Maxwell and the idea of Maxwell's demon into the development of computing. And then also this kind of history of software running the background off being used and called demon. So I'm thinking about the demons of the internet, which tends the title of the book, Internet Demons. And it's really been striking to me that thinking about how um, right now in this moment of COVID-19 and dealing with this pandemic, you see one of the immediate impacts about this is that network management is going to solve these bandwidth crises. And so you know, it's an interesting moment where immediately after you're thinking about what the crunch is going to be, can the internet hold up? 
And I was really struck in, in particular when people were describing, this is some of the work of Carl Bode, who I think is a really fantastic, probably my favorite journalist writing about broadband issues, um, just describes the fact that one of the ways that networks are going to manage or adapt to this is that they're going to use um, techniques to automatically deprioritize heavy users in overload areas. And that to me is striking because it speaks to a solution ready at hand. And where did that solution come from? And given the fact that, you know, we're seeing, I think, you know, more evident than ever, the internet being fundamental to communication rights and the right to communicate associated with human rights, um, how is it that there's a ready solution dealing with what could be seen as a very uncertain or tenuous or debatable time about how to manage a network that all of a sudden everybody's counting on uh, for all aspects of life as they're dealing with physical distancing. And so what I really want to make as a claim here is that bandwidth management is a problem without a good solution. And so this idea of bandwidth management that we're seeing for COVID-19 is about a long history about the debates about bandwidth management and the fact that we lack good frameworks, in my opinion, to evaluate both the social and technical consequences of bandwidth management. And to do that, I really want to talk about two moments in history. Hopefully you find these interesting. Uh, they're kind of vignettes that I pull from the book that I think are helpful in thinking about what the particular moment we're living in now. And I think to the end, how the human rights guidelines that I was able to review that, that your group is developing are really important and I think have these immediate applications. And so I think just to kind of commend what you're doing here and what the importance and relevance of, at least to me. So I'm gonna talk about, um, I'll begin with, you know, for the sake of time, uh, the work of Donald Davies. And this is my first case. So. Donald Davies, I think, is important because he, he's one of the first to imagine a common network as a, uh, as a shared network. And so this idea of what that means in the early 1960s. And so for Donald Davies, for those who don't know, he's most famous for being one of the kind of two figures that uh, Jan, Janet Abbott describes as the inventors of packet switching, uh, as well as Paul Boran. And you can also think that I think Louis Poisson um, in France is also seminal in this. So I think he's one figure, not kind of one of the only inventors, but I think he's quite important because he de uh, is responsible for developing uh, packets, which in Britain uh, at, the, um, at the National Physical Laboratory or NPL um, and is influential into the development of kind of modern day packet switching. But his own thinking about this and how this comes from, I think, really points to the challenge about this kind of network optimization issue and just to see how integral it is to the original Internet. And so at the time when Donald Davies was writing, he's part of, you know, he's part of uh, a lot of research being done in computer science about the ideas of uh, how do you move physical packages, move uh, logistical issues and how that translates into moving messages, building on tele telegraphy and message block systems and how there's optimal ways of routing information. And Davies is really intervening in this because he starts thinking about actually how there's a parallel between these routing issues and how early computer systems were working. And so with the expensive computing system in the 1960s, a lot of universities turned from having one computer to this idea of time sharing. And so this would be one computer resource that was responsible for uh, allowing all different types of users to connect and communicate. And, and this, I think, is part of the development of local area networks and some of the first computer networks, because as these uh, time sharing computers became more and more influential and more and more powerful, people could connect from home, you could think that uh, you could use a teletype device connected to a modem, which will allow you to phone in. And so the, these weren't just computer systems, they were actually computer networks. And how these computer networks um, manage these different demands was something that actually was inspirational to Donald Davis. So uh, drawing on archival research from from Donald Davis' work, you know, I, one of the things that I tend to is his, um, some of his experiences with, uh, some of his experiences with uh, the time computers and how it works with packet switching. And so just to give you an example here, what I mean is that 
so this is a great diagram that um, of, of Douglas Engelbart describing his kind of bootstrapping process. So this is concurrently, but you can see that, that there's computer screens and this is the meeting. And I think this is kind of fascinating because this is so akin to how we meet every day now where we have a laptop in front of us and we're talking around a computer and you can see this amazing can of Diet Coke there. Um, and, and this being a kind of just the, the imagination that's taking place this time where they're really trying to think about how do you create these networks that allow computers and humans to interact at the same time. And so this is this idea of networking that comes about is how do you connect users and computers as common users of the same network? What type of network would have to be developed or created that would allow different types of activity to happen at the same time? And this is really where Donald Davies begins to think about this idea of packet switching. That packet switching is a way of achieving what he at the time would describe as a common carriage network, which has a long history in media and telecommunications policy, you know, as almost as a network that is an essential service kind of unified network that would allow all different types of uh, applications at the same time. And so the benefit of packet switching uh, was that it would facilitate this idea of a multi-user network. And what he was interested in and the way this came about was that, move my pages here. And so what, um, you know, Davis was actually particularly interested in was some of the supervisors or some of the algorithms that these different early time sharing systems used to make decisions about what users, um, what what pri what, um, what applications would be run first and what applications would be run second. And the way the time sharing systems did this in part was that they broke down the computation time of the computer down into smaller chunks. And so that, you know, the, that it, there's set bits of time that people would have on the processor you know, based on how the clock itself would cycle between different activities. And this becomes, um, I think, you know, you can see this switched into how Davison's thinking, well, if you, instead of breaking down processor time, but instead you break down, say, network time into smaller packets, you could have this larger network utility being able to process um, resource and network resources on a per packet basis. And so this becomes, in, in the ways, the genesis of modern packet switching. And so when Davis then is starting to think about how you're going to deal with um, the challenge of this common carrier system, these multiple years, it would be through breaking up time in these parts. And so all I say is that you can, it's important to remember that the very principles of packet switching were, in a way, trying to end with this idea of how to create a network that everybody could use at the same time. And this, I think, is important just as a quick history note, is that in 1967, here is the Mountain View Hotel in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Subsequently, it has been torn down. Uh, so this is one of the last, this is a photo of it uh, or postcard of it. But this is actually Davies' work then went on to influence um, the developers of the ARPANET who were trying themselves to figure out this idea of packet switching. And so his work, along with Paul Brand, became really influential for the design of of what eventually became the TCP and IP protocols. Um, I'm just going to advance here for the sake of time. And so this, I think, becomes really interesting because in, in Davies' work, you can see the beginnings of what I would like to call the optimization problem. And this optimization problem really, I think, is integral to our debates today, is how does a network of networks deal with uh, resource time and scarce resource time um, with different demands? And what's the best way of solving that? And I think one of the things I tend to in the book is that largely becomes framed as a technical problem rather than a social or political one. Even though you see at the time Davies having ambitions of trying to convince the uh, National Post in, the, in Great Britain to um, create a network like this successfully, um, a lot of this was seen as being technical problems. And so matters of bandwidth being set aside. And this really... Um, also then became a kind of central debate. And I think one of the things to attend to 
is the way that many of the questions we have about what's efficient op network management has really been left in the technical literature. And Davies himself also became kind of relegated for his idea of how to deal with this because he proposed an, an I never can say this right, an arrhythmic network, where he thought the idea that the pack, the network would be running at full capacity at all times, and then you'd always know what its capacity is like, and you'd be replacing dummy packets with real packets, and this would be a way that you'd never have congestion because you'd always know how capable the network was. So I think it's also important that this is just the way the scope that this issue was solved. There's many different ways and there's many different forgotten ways of trying to solve this network optimization issue. But I think, you know, one of the key takeaways that Davies does is even though he imagines the things that packet switching is creating the ability of having a common network, it doesn't necessarily have a common purpose. And how do you deal with and, and, and adapt to these different demands is I think an integral and fundamental problem of contemporary networking and one that I think I contend sharing kind of the, I think the, the goals of this group, that it's not something you could think is simply as a technical matter. And just moving along, I'll also then talk about a second case, which I think is a more contemporary vignette, which I talk about fairly extensively in my book, um, which is called, uh, which is basically Comcat's activity. And, you know, we think now this term network neutrality, which I think is a very good way of thinking about how to solve this network management issue, um, has not solved the network management problem. And in the United States, there's no network neutrality and it's a very uneven uh, policy globally. But I want to talk about, you know, how, what does even network neutrality even look like? Um, well, one of the real beginnings of this was actually in 2007 when a user by the name of Funcords, who uh, known as, who was actually Rob Topolowski, found that he was having this problem selling, uh, sharing his Tin Pan Alley um, records on a peer-to-peer -peer network on a Comcast connection. And wholly unbeknownst, he has no idea why this is happening. No one knows why this is happening. This is a network effect that is not documented. There's no explanation of it. And basically through his own uh, technical prowess and the work of the EFF, um, as well as a variety of other, I think the Associated Press, um, there's an investigation into what's happening. And it's discovered that Comcast is actually targeting peer-to-peer -peer connections and um, causing those connections to reset in a way to manage bandwidth. And this, I think, really becomes an important moment because you think that this is when uh, you see this kind of return of network ban management as a as a political issue, where all of a sudden, uh, you know, this this is something that is um, that blows up in a way. And it's interesting in 2007. I was looking back last night, and you know, this is so. It seems so old and a long time ago to me, but also you can just think about how nascent this was. You know, YouTube was a little over a year old. Netflix had just started offering a streaming service. And even then you saw these networks trying to contend with this kind of very you know, difficult issue of how to manage demand for all these different competing applications on a common network. And this actually case led to, in the United States, the beginnings of the network neutrality case. And so there's a lot of contention between um, the federal communications, the FCC and Comcast over whether they had jurisdiction. And this, I think, little change in the network was, I think, you know, set aside a decade of subsequent legal work. And, you know, what I want to focus on is actually a bit about how technically what was happening here. Because again, I think it shows some of the ways that we think this has been solved at a technical level, and yet it remains. Um, and you can think that there's issues of bandwidth by protocol. Uh, and so at the time, that when Comcast was dealing with this, you have to think that it DOCSIS 2, which um, had just been implemented. And so DOCSIS had these kind of, sorry, step back. Also, Comcast was dealing with this kind of difficult moment where in 2006 and 2007, there's this new phenomenon of peer to peer networking um, that was, you know, becoming more and more popular. And that this created a kind of a new problem for Comcast how to manage this new application of the internet. Um, there was a growing problem because these protocols were trying to be more um, difficult to detect. This is a phenomenon called protocol obf obfuscation. 
And there's also limitations in, in actual how Comcast as the cable network uh, using Doxis could provision uh, user uploading, which is a real uh, bottleneck for them because um, Doxis doesn't allow for um, a lot of uploading the design. And so what Sandvine eventually decided to do was install a, sorry, what Comcast eventually decided to do was install a, a Sandvine PTS 820 switch, which would be responsible for uh, slowing down and stopping this peer-to-peer -peer traffic. And it's really interesting, and, I, and I'm gonna skip over this for the sake of time, Comcast um, didn't follow recommendations of Sandvine about how to do this type of throttling. Instead, what it did was it installed uh, a Sandvine um, offline that was monitoring traffic and when it noticed a certain node a certain sector of its network um, becoming over congested what it would do it was start injecting so it would start modifying the communications between the kind of node to the home and inject reset packets so that it would so that it would trick peer-to-peer -peer networks into thinking that they weren't getting reply and because so many of these networks required symmetrical upload and download, uh, this would cause the connection to be throttled on the applications themselves because the user wasn't uploading as much as they were responsible for. And the PTS would continue to do that at the level of the node itself. So it'd be rejected, would be in, you know, in embedding reset um, throughout this in a way of, um, as a way of throttling these peer-to-peer -peer traffic. And so, peer-to-peer uh, -peer activities. And so this became a, um, you know, a huge debate. Can people hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Uh, oh, okay. It's just you. I'm sorry. It's fine. Um, and so all the way, this, this was seen as being a pro discriminating against protocols. And this was, you know, ultimately rejected. And so part of what Comcast did in its submissions to the FCC was saying, we're going to do a new way of dealing with, um, we're going to do a new solution. And this became RFC 6057 Comcast Protocol Agnostic Congestion Management System. And it is a way of, um, and it's a way that in, in a similar fashion, it now starts targeting users that are using um, more than, a, if an average of more than 70% of a port's upstream bandwidth capacity and more than 80% of its downstream capacity is being utilized over a 15 minute period, Comcast system would kick in and then start degrading the connection of that individual user. And this still is in place from my understanding about how you're dealing with networks trying to manage high bandwidth users. And I think it was emblematic of seeing um, when you're seeing this reporting about networks being able to intelli intelligently and automatically deprioritize uh, the traffic of heavy users in open areas. And so this is in part how Comcast is, is you know, allowed for network optimization to take place. Uh, and I think is, in, you know, is the uh, resources being used in domestic broadband networks that are um, you know, potentially the response to this COVID-19 and the fact that this kind of is buried or lost is a technical decision, which is having these kind of wide ranging consequences about who all of a sudden are the new heavy users and how is this technique, I think, continued potentially in this reporting uh, into a very different context of internet use. And so this really, I think, points to a, a real fundamental question to me is that managing bandwidth is, um, is a governance issue and that you know, the challenge that we have now is that we can manage bandwidth, but managing bandwidth, bandwidth managing bandwidth management is a real, ch you know, challenge in the future. And I think in these two vignettes, you can see with the Donald Davies point, the way this is kind of constituted is a seminal problem or a kind of central problem, the internet itself. And in some ways, the kind of very ad hoc ways that we've solved this in the case, I think speaks to the moment now where I think there's a lot more pressure on broadband networks and yet the ways that we have uh, solutions to find remedies for these issues of network management still continue to be underdeveloped. And so I think one of the implications today going forward, you can think that 
First off, there's a challenge because automation is, is only going to compound these issues. And so, as I was saying, I'm happy to talk about it, about the kind of impacts of artificial intelligence being used as a way of cost savings by a lot of contemporary telecommunications companies. Uh, it's going to only reduce this. So, if you think about this kind of idea of how Comcast was doing it, the way that artificial intelligence is being positioned is that it's going to make those same types of network decisions smarter. Um, there's also a real challenge because many of the policy forms of the places where these decisions are being debated are kind of captured or highly politicized. So it's hard to actually advocate for kind of frameworks um, given the kind of context and the politics around it. And increasingly with 5G, uh, something if Neil's on the call, I can talk about, um, you know, they're requiring much more complex network management. So these decisions are, you know, far simpler, you know, far more difficult than Donald Davies time. And so, to me, I think it's the kind of an end to the talk. I just want to emphasize that bandwidth management is, a, is another site of these challenges about connecting human rights to um, aspects of the internet. And I really am actually excited because in other parts of my work, I'm seeing the rise of algorithmic impact assessments and different ways of understanding the social and cultural and political consequences of techn technologies. And I'm really interested in what are solutions and so, you know, one of the things that I think is really important and, you know, I just want to kind of encourage and, and uh, you know, learn from how your own group is kind of developing these human rights guidelines and what are the ways that these human rights guidelines might also be a potential solution to these network management issues. And that's something I hope we can have for a discussion on the call. So I've got time, but uh, that's my presentation. Um, all I'll say is I've also shared some slides of other presentations I've made recently, and uh, I'm looking forward to discussion and thanks so much listening. Uh, it was a real uh, privilege. Thank you so much, Fenwick. That was really interesting. And I uh, would recommend others pick up his book if you haven't already. Um, we do have time for questions because I was the one who ran us late in the beginning. So please jump in. Let's talk for um, until quarter two. Thank you so much for the talk. That was really wonderful. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on something that I'm sure you've come across in your research. Sorry, as a bit, a bit of background. Hi, my name is Corinne. I'm a PhD student at the Oxford Internet Institute, and I'm writing an ethnography of human rights advocacy within the IRTF and IETF. Um, and one of the things that I was wondering about is you uh, brought up these various examples of different actors making decisions um, towards particular sort of pro-social goals. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the different factors that led to those outcomes and if there's any sort of consistency across the different vignettes and the, uh, across the different case studies that you've looked at. I think that's a great question. I think one of the one of the um, you know parts going forward from this book was trying to think more about this, these issues as governance. And I think um, the thing I'd say first off is that, you know, part of the objective of the book was actually to kind of politicize that and to make it clear how these decisions consequential and ones that weren't simply technical. And um, I, I think the two things I'd say is that you can think about, um, you know, at least three domains where these decisions are being made. And, um, you could, that part of this is in the computer science literature, where you're talking about the development of techniques and best practices. Uh, the second is in internet governance, the conventional internet governance principles like IETF and um, the IRTF, which I'm new to, and, and then also in the kind of media policy circles. And so, you know, the way that, you know, remain in Canada, where I'm at least most familiar, uh, is in the 2009 hearings on zero rating, which is this ability of mobile networks of being able to um, decide which networks had um, could, could, could not count towards your cap. And all I'll say is that I think it's in many ways up, attending to and comparing these different governance mechanisms, more formal ones that draw out of the history of media policy, uh, as well as familiar with its internet governance as parts of these moments. I think the one thing that I think is common across these is that very often the technical side of the technical debate uh, is lost. And so you see a real gap 
where there's a technical solution with Sinclair, which is not in dialogue with the policy uh, world, which is in, in turn not in dialogue with the te technology. And so how do you actually find that connection between the, the you know, the, the two worlds? And I, and I think the, you know, framing network management is a purely technical issue or often what was done in a lot of the network neutrality docu documents is referred to it as a form of network optimization, which was so actually now that it's dead and buried, but when it existed, the FCC's open internet order actually allowed for something like Comcast activity because it would have been a form of network optimization, which would have been this technical decision. So you can think that it, I think all I say is that there's different governance strategies, but two commonalities I'm noticing is one, very often the technology is seen as something that's outside of these policy debates and the policy debates are largely unaware of or incapable of understanding the kind of technologies that work here. I hope that's helpful. Um, so Niels, and don't forget to introduce yourself when you start speaking. Thank you very much, Mallory. And also thank you very much, Fenwick. This is Niels Tenhofer from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, first, Fenwick, thanks a lot for the talk, but also thank you very much for writing this very insightful book in which you really uh, thoughtfully and carefully combine technical knowledge, policy language, but also media studies literature and provide a very productive lens. So thank you very much for that. And I'd like to uh, uh, pick up where you left off uh, 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 and ask you where you would where you would put authoritative decision making or where you would put anchors for doing the analysis and or enforcement because what we see a lot in distributed internet governance is the uh, uh, is the is the adage or the motto we are not the protocol police we are not the routing police everything is based on voluntary norms and uh, voluntary protocol adoption so where and who is responsible and who should uh, enforce that to 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 negotiate between these multilateral or national regimes and the global standards regimes or the, or is or are we doomed to have this eternal disconnect with with, with this kind of uh, uh, technology that we have uh, thank you so much first for the kind words and second, i'm also this is uh, you know in some ways passing a torch to you and i'm looking forward to you know, your fantastic work uh, to continue continue this and so uh, you know all, all i say is i'm hoping that you know this conversation is it continues and uh, it's also nice to hear i think your voice for the first time so uh, you know kudos um, I, you know i think that's a really great question and you know i'll say two things that i don't have a clear answer i think one part of I think frustration and a real disappointment for me has been in terms of internet measurement. Um, I put a lot of work into internet measurement. Um, I could talk to you for hours about off net, on net measurement lab, people that I really uh, believe in. And the real challenge about um, seeing protocols about network measurement translate into policy domains and circles. And I think that, because all I say is, I think that that's one part where you could see a lot more consensus is that even if you disagree about you know the way this network is being run you could you could actually say well you could understand how it's being run through public internet management uh, public internet uh methods you know this is like how fast your internet connection is a latency as well as like a variety of like ad hoc solutions to detect whether there's throttling taking place and this i point to the really fantastic work of dave Chofneys, who's been real influence on me um as we we tool um and yet, none of that I find has really influenced these broadband, domestic broadband policy in Canada. And I think that, you know, one area that you might, you know, think about this is just in terms of not necessarily being a police, but being able to do, um, be accountable for the descriptions of how the network is operating. And that I think something is coming from a description that's from not necessarily industry, I think it's kind of vital. And so I think that's one place that really has stalled, I think, in my opinion, even though I think the technology has advanced a lot, you're not seeing that connection. And that would be one point in Locus. Um, I feel as though the second point is that, you know, internet governance is really run in two parallel tracks and you have your domestic media policy and your internet governance. 
And in many ways, I've always looked to the domestic stuff because that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where you're seeing funding for um, you know, broadband deployment development, at least in Canada, as well as these decisions being made about how ISPs should or should not be doing this. And what I would really hope is that you see this a bit with the internet society participating, but uh, you know, more local efforts and more international collaboration to intervene in these domestic policy circles. And I think taking on maybe not necessarily to always have the right um, answer, but to at least be able to be informed and allow for um, what frankly can be some disinformation circulating uh, about how these networks work, you know, raising the bar and threshold for that. So I think that those would be the two um, parts to me that I would look at is one, continuing internet measurement and two, looking about how translating the work being done here into interventions at the domestic level um, because those continue to be, I think, the part where there is the police happening. Thanks. Yeah, thanks again. Um, we're going to move on to the second uh, presentation now, but Fenwick, we hope that you can stick around for the rest of the meeting and maybe even participate in HRPC going forward. Um, so thanks again. Um, next up is a presentation by Gershbad Grover, who is um, a longtime participant in HRPC, talking about censorship in India. Before that gets started, and while Gershbad is queuing up his slides, I just want to remind everyone to please put your names down in the uh, notes uh, as part of our blue sheets. And if you are having trouble with slides or you can't view them right now, um, you can download them from Data Tracker. Um, and this is being recorded. It will be made available later. So you can also come back and view the slides if you are mobile right now or for some other reason unable to view them. Um, any troubleshooting discussion we need to have? Gershaban, how's it going? Yep, I'll uh, start sharing my screen. Fantastic. Did that work? It Perfect. did. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, I'm. I'm actually very excited uh, by the way the last uh, talk and uh, question ended, because um, this presentation is uh, precisely about where we left off, and that's about how. Uh, internet measurement can influence policy debates. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to take around 20, 25 minutes to talk about a recent uh, paper that we've done. And I, I mean, web censorship is a, a topic where uh, in this research group familiar with, I'd uh, sort of like to contextualize the problem in terms of uh, how the problems in the law can motivate us to study technical problems when it comes to uh, internet protocols and how uh, the results we find can sort of influence uh, governance and policy in the future. So uh, web censorship just generally is, uh, to me, a, 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 an important area to study uh, because uh, the Indian government does a lot of it. Uh, India has had the maximum number of internet shutdowns imposed by any government in the world. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about a specific online censorship problem, though, which is just uh, website blocking. And in India, the legal background is uh, that there are two uh, provisions in the Information Technology Act, 69A and 79. And they have some delegated legislation issued under it. And through these provisions, governments and courts can pass orders to ISPs, uh, internet service providers, to block certain websites. So uh, on, on the right, you just have a snippet of these sections. And uh, there are two things notable here. First is that in the second um, image there, you'll see that there is a rule that says requests and complaints under these rules uh, should be maintained with strict confidentiality. So what that means is that when uh, when the central government passes an order to an internet service provider, the internet service provider will not reveal this information to you, and uh, 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 neither will the government. So, sorry, is there? Ah, okay. Oh, 
Okay, is this better? Yes. Thanks. Oh. I, I think going to full screen sort of stops the broadcast. So I'll keep it this way. Um, ah, cool. So uh, essentially, lots of uh, civil society activists and research organizations have tried to ask the government, what are the websites that are blocked in India? What, uh, what are the websites you've ordered ISPs to block for their users? And the government frequently rejects these requests based on national security and uh, public order and uh, other grounds. The second notable thing in the images that you'll see that all of them are sourced from a site called indiankanoon.org, which is an open legal database, which is very useful for um, legal researchers uh, studying uh, the Indian framework. And that will become relevant in just a second. Uh, so I, I just want to start with saying the law is not covering anything that's related to accessing blocked websites. So it's not punishable to access blocked websites. So uh, we could sort of proceed with uh, our paper without any legal concerns. But uh, in case you're interested in network measurement broadly, I really recommend the work of Sensor Planet, and uh, which is a lab run by Professor Roya and Safi. Uh, and so the usual experience of web censorship is that you will try to access a blocked website and uh, you will see this sort of notice, which uh, the text might be too small to read, but it says, you are not authorized to access this web page as per the DOT compliance, where uh, DOT is the Department of Telecom. Uh, and we have frequently these stories coming up where uh, even popular services uh, are inaccessible by users. So this is a router story from April 2019, for instance, where people couldn't access uh, Reddit and Telegram. And if we look deeper in the article, we'll find that uh, Reliance Geo, which is the most popular ISP in India, was found to be blocking the website I just mentioned, which is indiankanoon.org. And uh, Sushant Sinha, the article mentions it incorrectly as Sushant Sharma, I think. But he contacted Reliance Geo and said, why is my website blocked? Reliance Geo replied, oh, the government ordered us to do so but they rescinded the order on the same day. So your website is accessible again. So uh, uh, th this is the kind of opaqueness that governs the website blocking system in general. And what complicates problem is that indiankanoon.org then filed a right to information request with the government, with the Department of Telecommunications. And they replied that we have no such information. Therefore, the government is saying that we never ordered your website to be blocked. And that could mean two things. A, the government is lying. Or B, Reliance just uh, Reliance Geo just blocked the websites on its own whims. And therefore, uh, uh, and, and there are lots of st uh, such stories. I'll skip the one for dowrycalculator.com, even though that's very interesting. But uh, Reddit, Telegram, uh, collegehumor.com, Pirate Bay, lots of uh, pirating websites, lots of uh, pornographic websites are uh, you'll normally find blocked in India. And so this motivated us to sort of study two research questions. A, what are the methods ISP is using to block websites? And uh, the second one is, are all ISPs blocking the same websites? As I mentioned earlier in that Reuters report, it was uh, reported that only Reliance Geo was found to be blocking Indian Kanoon.org and not other ISPs. Therefore, that calls into question whether uh, uh, either Reliance Geo is making the order up or uh, other ISPs uh, didn't act on a legitimate order. And there's uh, lots of related work in the web censorship area that uh, we sort of relied to build on to have measurements uh, for India. And there are studies uh, across the world, really. And of specific interest to us was obviously Uni, which is uh, perhaps uh, the most popular uh, tool in this area. And uh, when I talk about these tools and studies I'll, uh, in our methodology, I'll try to uh, mention how we build upon the previous work and why we couldn't rely on this uh, older work entirely to run our tests. And uh, in, in the literature, we mostly found that most web censorship work and measurement has focused on uh, countries like Iran and China, where there are centralized censorship mechanisms. So you have 
central points of control where all traffic uh, can usually pass through and those are controlled. Uh, there are very few studies on uh, decentralized mechanisms like we have in India where the government is passing orders to ISPs to block websites and isn't uh, involved in the tech technical implementation at all. Uh, in fact, the blocking rules that I showed on a slide earlier, they do not mention any technical method that should be used by ISP to block websites. And in that case, they're just free to adopt any method. And this creates lots of uncertainties in how Indian citizens will experience web censorship. Uh, there's only been one study that uh, tries to map it, but uh, that was entirely focused on the technical methods used by ISPs and uh, uh, specifically locating what are the networking middle boxes employed by internet service providers to block websites and the methods they're using. Uh, there are two sort of gaps in that study we have tried to uh, build and cover on, which is A, they didn't study whether all ISPs were blocking on uh, all websites on uh, at, at a uh, considerable scale. And the second thing is that they were not uh, exhaustively testing for all sorts of web censorship methods possible. And so what we did is, since the government won't tell us what websites are blocked, we created a list of potentially blocked websites, as we're calling it. And so we got some publicly available orders and some leaked government orders, and then uh, some court orders and you know, user reports that were uh, collected by the Internet Freedom Foundation, which is basically users saying, oh, I can't access this website. And the majority of the URLs we collected were uh, from court orders. And we uh, sort of removed the duplicates, and then we uh, stripped the URLs off to just reserve the host names. And then we sort of arrived at the, around 4,300 host names, which are potentially blocked in India. And uh, as we found, this is the, uh, I mean, largest such uh, uh, sort of set till now. And then we ran a variety of network tests from six major ISPs in India. That's ACT, Airtel, BSNL, Reliance, COMT, NL, and Vodafone. And uh, we, uh, j just to give you a sense of, uh, the sort of population these ISPs cover, They're, they serve 98.82% 90 of internet subscribers in India, and that's approximately uh, 650 million people. So uh, the first thing we tested for, and um, I mean, we've spoken about this at the ITF and in this group as well, which is uh, DNS-based censorship. Uh, this is when uh, you send a DNS query and you want the IP address for a particular domain name you want to access, and the ISP, uh, which is running the DNS server, just uh, sort of replies with an incorrect IP address. And the second sort of method in the same vein is DNS injection, where you're not using, let's say you're not necessarily using your DN, uh, ISP's DNS server, but you send a DNS query, and uh, the ISP has a middle box somewhere, and it uh, since these are in plain text, they catch the host name that they want to block and return the fake IP address again. Uh, so here what we're doing is that previous methods have a, uh, either simply compared a test resolver with a trusted resolver's response. So you run it from the ISP you're testing on and then compare it with, let's say, you got a response through Tor or uh, let's say Google's uh, DNS over HTTPS server. And but the problem with this is, of course, that trusted resolvers can return a different IP address even in legitimate scenarios. So for load balancing purposes or for, uh, I mean, uh, locating a server that's closer to you for uh, better performance for you. And so uh, now it all sort of try to fix this problem by selecting multiple resolvers. And so they pinged five resolvers and created a set of the responses they got. Uh, and then only investigated where the response was the same for all trusted resolvers. And we couldn't use this method because uh, we sort of wanted to, wanted to focus on website in, uh, inconsistencies in website block lists. So, and this would cause a significant reduction in our test list. So, uh, and what the previous paper, which I mentioned uh, that studied in Indian web censorship, what it recorded was that 
uh, what they relied on was if you are on an ISP, if you get an IP address which belongs to the same autonomous system as the ISPs, then they mark uh, the response as censored. And this sort of makes two technical assumptions, which is that the ISP will always return an IP address that belongs to the same autonomous system, which may not be true. And the second thing is, what if the actual website is hosted on the same AS? Uh, so we tried to sort of address these concerns in the previous work uh, here. And what we do is that we uh, ping five trusted resolvers, get the response for our domain name. And if the, uh, if the IP address we got was in the set that we got from our trusted resolvers, then it's not censored. If, it's, if we got responses from other resolvers, but uh, the D DNS server of the ISP is giving us uh, uh, NX domain response, which is like not found, or uh, a, a Bogon reserved IP, then we say it's censored. And uh, in other cases, what we do is we try to find out, is there an IP address present with an unusually high frequency? And what we mean by unusually high frequency here is that we compare all the data we've uh, gathered from these trusted resolvers and see whether an IP address is present with the same unusual frequency in other sets. And that sort of uh, will help us identify uh, whether there's a specific IP address being returned by the, uh, whether there's a specific IP address being returned by the ISP when they want to censor websites. Uh, so uh, quickly on uh, uh, HTTP as well. So uh, plain text HTTP queries are carrying a host name usually in plain text. And again, ISPs can have like middle boxes that pick up uh, the name of the website you're trying to access and then either reset your connection or return a censorship notice or something like that. And uh, here, uh, there's previous work in this domain as well, where I'll, I'll skip this part because we're not actually building a lot uh, on, uh, I mean, we're building on previous work, but uh, uh, we relied mostly on what Uni does. We added a few more um, uh, uh, sort of heuristics to get whether the website was censored. But uh, our methodology is basically that if you uh, uh, try to uh, access the website and you get different sex, uh, different status codes in the response, then it's censored. If uh, the response length and bodies are not matching, then it's censored. And if they're not redirecting to the same URL, then it's censored. Or uh, the session header keys are not matching. So uh, the technique we developed here is uh, uh, just a little bit better than Uni's when it comes to its uh, uh, precision recall and F1 score. Uh, the third method we tested for, and this actually hadn't been done for India, and uh, there's a lack of studying this problem globally, I, I, I would say, is documenting cases where uh, censorship is happening through the server name indication, which is, of, of course, the extension in TLS that allows you to mention the uh, name of uh, the host name if the server you're trying to connect to is hosting multiple uh, websites. And, and it, it works almost the same way. There's a middle box that detects the SNI in your request and then sends you a uh, reset packet. Now, this is, this is notable because this choice is actually not allowing you to serve censorship notices. TLS is uh, built to be secure, so there's no there's no way you can fake a response or send a forged page. Uh, therefore, if any ISP is using this method, and we'll see that uh, some Indian ISPs are, then users will not see a censorship notice. They'll just see uh, oh, error, uh, uh, I mean, whatever the browser generates as the, the connection reset error. And uh, this methodology, I, I, I think, is entirely new. What we do is that we set up a server that's accepting connections, even if it doesn't host the uh, website that you enter in the SNI. And the uh, from the device, we try to establish a TLS 1.3 connection. And uh, we're using specifically TLS 1.3 because the certificate in the server response will be encrypted. And therefore, we can be sure that the ISP is actually using the SNI and not the certificate information to censor the website. And if we uh, spot a, a a failure in the connection, then we mark the website as censored. And uh, 
basically, after we ran all the tests for all the different websites, we got very interesting results. I'll just start with the results on censorship techniques. And we found that ISPs are using a mix of techniques and some, in fact, are using uh, more than one technique to censor websites. And uh, we only found one ISP, which is using SNI-based uh, censorship, which I'll get to in a moment. What was uh, perhaps unusual is that if, if an ISP is using two methods, then uh, for instance, ACT, then it was using DNS to censor, sorry, only DNS to censor 233 websites and only HTTP for 1873 and both to block 1615 websites. So in, in fact, the way they were censoring websites was not consistent even in a single ISP across the methods it was using. And this is true for, uh, this we found to be true for any ISP that was using multiple methods. Uh, so this is just, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, the data we got from that. Geo was slightly better on the front that uh, there was a huge overlap. And so uh, when it comes to DNS, four ISPs are using DNS censorship still, and most of them are sending censorship notices. Uh, they basically send you an IP address uh, which they have control over and they've set up uh, set it up to respond with a censorship notice. Uh, and Airtel is the only one not sending censorship notice uh, notices and it just responds with the NX domain uh, response. And uh, we uh, found no instances of collateral censorship, which uh, is essentially that if you're on an ISP, you experience censorship because of another ISP, because of uh, the uh, networks being interconnected. So uh, there was no such case when it comes to DNS. There was, uh, sim uh, I mean, four ISPs we found to be using HTTP-based censorship. And again, Airtel was the one that was not sending, uh, serving censorship notices. And in this case, we did observe some collateral censorship. So for example, BSNL and MTLN are actually not using HTTP-based methods of blocking, but uh, you will sometimes find Airtel and ACT notices being served to you uh, because the traffic is uh, probably carried through their networks and some middle box of theirs responds instead. Uh, so uh, SNI was only being used by Reliance Geo, which is in fact the most uh, popular ISP in India. And as I said, this is a censorship technique that makes it impossible for you to serve censorship notices. And uh, therefore, you will just see an error if you're on Reliance Geo and they're blocking a website for you. Uh, so this is, uh, now I'll come to whether all ISPs are blocking websites and the simple really answer from the data is absolutely no. Because we found, uh, I mean, th this table just summarizes the number of blocked websites out of 4033 that we tested for. But in fact, uh, what, what you'll see is that only 27% of all the te websites we tested for are blocked by all six ISPs. So therefore, uh, this is real evidence for how compliance of blocking orders is not uniform across all ISPs. In fact, that um, there are lots of websites that are only being blocked by one ISP out of the six we tested for. And this really calls into questions the uh, how they're basing what websites they're blocking. And I'll, I'll come to the significance and how it sort of ties into uh, the policy debate in just a second. And But uh, this is just a, a sort of map to help us see the overlap between the block lists of different ISPs. So uh, you'll see that it's mostly around 50% and uh, so in some cases it's a little more. So there's just widespread inconsistencies in block lists uh, across uh, India. And so this sort of, this data sort of leads us to two observations, I, I mean, two possibilities. One is that ISPs are not complying with website blocking orders or a subsequent unblocking order, or B, they're arbitrary blocking websites without any legal order. And uh, here is, uh, in both cases, what we can say for sure is that India's net neutrality regulations are being prohibited. Uh, you cannot discriminate between traffic if you are not uh, asked to do so uh, through a legal order. 
therefore this uh, i mean the paper uh, not just in terms of terms of finding experiences of web censorship and uh, documenting the technical methods chosen by isps we have concrete evidence now that isps are are violating uh, net neutrality regulations in india and uh, that leads us to sort of two three things which is that we need to uh, reevaluate uh, the legal mechanism because it's not allowing users a chance of a hearing it's not uh, uh, the regulations are not mentioning any technical method so isps are doing anything that they wish uh, second we there's a severe like uh, the result shows that we really need a net neutrality monitoring mechanism in place uh because apparently no one is reporting it to the regulatory and uh, they haven't uh, acted uh, on these reports as well and third is perhaps uh, a link i haven't seen in uh, like previous literature so uh, i i thought it'll be okay to spend a, an extra second on it which is that certain technical choices make it impossible for you to serve censorship notices and as i said the law in india is already opaque and therefore your technical methods are basically uh, exacerbating the concerns created by the legal framework and this is just a uh, as i said if they're using http blocking uh, you will see this you're not authorized to access this web page if you if they were using sni you would face this uh, connection reset error on your browser and uh basically we we hope that this sort of data leads the regulator to act on this problem but uh, there's also a future work we want to uh, continue doing in this domain which is uh since it's not illegal to circumvent censorship that's a gap in the law we want to uh use this work to have more efficient censorship circumvention mechanisms rather than advocating everyone to use vpns etc which is uh, uh, I, i mean you could simply sort of use a dns uh, server if your isp is only using dns blocking you could um, the the previous study on web censorship in india found that there were little tweaks that you could do for instance when isps are detecting http host headers there Uh, their tests are case sensitive so if you just change the spelling of host you can get past the censorship in uh, if you sort of adjust the headers and uh, the second sort of more important thing in the area is that we need uh, readings from all across the country because lots of these methods rely on the presence of networking middle boxes and uh, just generally speaking they they haven't been uh, deployed uh, across the country so therefore you can have really widely different experiences of web censorship across india and uh yes i'll i'll, I'll stop here i wanted to thank uh, i i mean the co-authors and uh, uh also akash for helping me uh, uh, design the slides and yes i'll uh, i'm happy to answer any questions or feedback Thanks Gershabad. Um if you want to jump in the queue, you can just start talking or put your name in the chat. Um Jonathan Hoyland, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Um could you compare or comment on the difference between how India does its blocking and how South Korea do their blocking? So, uh I I actually haven't uh, studied South Korea in detail but there are uh, two sort of uh, facts that I know that are plainly very different A is that the South Korean regulator is telling ISPs to what uh, as as to what methods they must choose for blocking so recently there was a report that South Korea asked networks to use SNI based censorship uh and uh yes I Well, sorry that's just one difference i know from the top of my head but uh, i i think both both are having like a decentralized mechanism where uh, governments order isps to do it i'll i'll also comment on the fact that south korea is more transparent when it comes to what websites they are blocking so they uh, as opposed to uh, the case in india where the government can pass confidential orders to isps and you never know what website will be blocked the next day in south korea it's uh, they have published documents on 
exactly on what they want blocked and which is uh, uh, if i remember correctly it's mostly gambling and pornography thank you okay go ahead finwick okay thank you I just want to say thank you. That was a really excellent presentation. I, and, uh, you know, two points just to compliment. I think one, the making the point about transparency and what blocking mechanisms is really important. And I think second, uh, you know, it's again, it's a great reminder of just the, um, you know, that the work of um, internet monitoring isn't done when network neutrality is in place. And so it's really kind of fascinating. I just had, um, um, kind of two questions, and I think you sort of answered the, the second one. And apologies if you've answered the first one. But what was your um, first? What was your testing infrastructure? Was it just in one city, or I just wanted to speak to that because I think that's a really important part. Uh, you might have touched on it. And I'm sorry if I had to duck out of the room, but I'd love to hear a bit more about what was the infrastructure to do the testing. Um, and then two, if I'm correct, then then uh, the Indian actually maintain a block list. Like in Canada, we have clean feed and ISPs were actually advocating to create a extension of that to block copyright infringement sites, which was shut down. Um, but I'm just wondering that this is, as your point, there's nothing that's coordinating this. And so this is all ad hoc at ISP levels from your understanding. Yes, on, on the first question, uh, my apologies, actually, I should have mentioned it in the beginning. Uh, uh, we only ran the test from one location that is uh, Bangalore where we're all based currently and uh, uh, that's why I mentioned in the future work that we uh, uh, what we're doing is now developing a mobile app that we can distribute to volunteers all across the country so we can get readings from everywhere and uh, uh, we're already sort of in the last phases of uh, releasing the app and if uh, uh, anyone on the call here is from India, we'd love to connect and uh, help you help. Uh, you can help us gather readings on the second question. It's uh, uh, the true answer is I, I don't know because the government won't tell me. And what we've done is try to send um, uh, right to information requests, uh, which is a law that uh, basically allows citizens to get documents from the government and what they cite is either the confidentiality rule under the law to say that we can't share the list of blocked websites or b they say uh, uh, we can't share the uh, website block list on national security grounds uh, of course there is a question whether they maintain a central list at all and uh, we do not know this answer to this at all what we've seen from leaked orders is that uh, they are monitoring certain behavior, but it's very hard hoc. For instance, we had an order which said, which asked an ISP to effectively block one website because it found that uh, users were still being able to access it. What we found were uh, rescinding orders, so which might have a low compliance rate and uh, because the government wouldn't care whether a website is unblocked now. And uh, uh, sort of another thing to keep in mind is that uh, because they're rejecting these requests and this the law is so opaque that uh, uh, I, I don't know if there's there's any way to sort of know the answer except whether your, uh, whether any uh, uh, government orders get leaked only then we'll know I suppose just one quick follow-up I think yeah one other thing that for discussion is that I know um, there's been movements to do um, you know hardware based testing through Raspberry Pis. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's one other place to, to think about rolling out the testing method because often that's a challenge with the kind of self apps. And that's not a criticism, mm -hmm. but I do think it's actually, you know, one point of comparison. I think that I'd love to see more research working on developing some sort of common testing platform using a Pi as a basis where you'd have like test happening perpetuity. Um, and so I just want to say that that's something else I'm kind of interested in um, and looking forward to hearing about the app, the answer. Thanks, everybody. Um, Vittorio? Yes. Uh, point on transparency, which, I mean, as you know, I see this from the other side. So uh, I don't work for an ISP, but I work for a software company that makes DNS software, which is also used by our customers to do this kind of filtering. And uh, I mean, the 
encourage people in the view much like uh, to be able to provide more transparency and uh, better user experience on this but on the other hand the problem is that there is no standard to do it it depends on the way you, you do this but he, he, i mean this is increasingly becoming a cat and game a cat and mouse game in which uh, isps have to come up with uh, dirtier tricks uh, uh, to, to be able to cope with the fact that on the other hand some communication is moving to encrypted and so it becomes harder to intercept it and then do the filter and on the other hand, they cannot just stop, stop filtering because they are required by law, at least in certain countries, to do so. So, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, th there has been some resistance in, let's say, working on technical ways this work uh, smoothly whenever it's necessary. And uh, I, I understand why. I understand that many people don't like this uh, happening at all. But on the other hand, uh, the practical result is not that, it, that there is less uh, blocking is that uh, the, the blocking is getting worse and worse in terms of transparency and user experience. And by the way, this is also a damage for the smaller ISPs because when, while the big ISPs have the resources to cope with this, and so to make more and more technical resources and people dealing with the complexities, the smaller ISPs have a hard time complying with whatever order they receive. Uh, it seems that the technology is getting more complex and more costly and still they have to do it uh, by law or by... And I'd be happy to, to work on this from another perspective. Then, of course, that not everyone will agree. No, uh, thanks, Atul. I'd just like to add that uh, when there's a legal vacuum around what method to use, like uh, as is the case in India, then I, I mean, at least what I'd advocate for is that ISPs choose a transparent method. And obviously, I know this answer is coming from ignorance about whether the government is pushing pressure on ISPs to. Uh, sort of, let's say, deploy SNI blocking, which makes it impossible to serve censorship notices, just because uh, it, it gives you more censorship coverage. Uh, 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 so, uh, honestly, I, I currently do not know about those pressures. Of course, there's the fact that if you do not comply with these orders, your ISP license can be taken away in India. Uh, uh, so, yes, I mean, there's definitely, uh, I, I mean, that tussle there, but uh, what uh, in in the absence of regulations mentioning it, I I uh, I sort of hope that ISPs will choose transparent methods of blocking. All right. Um, so I added myself to the queue just because on slide thirty five, I wanted uh, to know how to interpret the um, Vodafone. So does that mean that they're not blocking anything oh. or does it mean that they're blocking something but you don't know how they're blocking it or it's Sorry. not one of the three methods? Just curious. No, uh, Madri, thanks. You've got a typo. They're using DNS and HTTP. I'm sorry for not uh, checking that. <laughs> okay, cool. An easy answer. Uh, Jonathan? Sorry, they only, <laughs> let me just, they're only using HTTP, I think. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, so in, in some future world where we where we have widely deployed DNS over HTTPS and mm. ESNI. Yes. Um, one, do you know of any methods that would currently allow ISPs to block that? And two, isn't there a risk that if it's enshrined in law to use SNI blocking, then if SNI blocking becomes ineffective, is there some uh, is there some way for the IPs to comply with the law? I.e. if they're told you must block with this method, but that method doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, what can they do? I think uh, th th that's a great question. And I, I personally am uh, sort of have advocated against uh, the current censorship uh, regime. So I, I'll try to answer your question in a broader way, which is that the legal regime is so uh, opaque that uh, to me, all website blocking in India seems unjustifiable. Even when courts are passing orders to, uh, to ISPs to block websites, they're uh, making no attempt to uh, contact the owners and uh, sort of administrators of the websites. At, at the same time, uh, one disadvantage of sort of prescribing the method in the law is, as you said, it, uh, the law will sort of run behind technical methods then. and uh, 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 to be honest, I, I still don't have a concrete answer to whether the law should prescribe a method because in the absence of a law, I said, uh, as I said, 
you can advocate ISPs to use less invasive and more transparent methods. I, uh, I, uh, I, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts maybe after this as well on whether you think the law should prescribe a blocking method at all. And Vittorio says something in the chat, which is that most countries say just you have to block. It's your problem to find a way. Um, hmm. It'd be interesting, huh. actually, as a piece of research to figure out what are the different ways that governments do this. I know it's been a theme throughout your presentation um, about the differences, but I think those policy differences actually have an impact and could be really mm -hmm. interesting for us to look into more. Um, so I've closed the queue. Uh, we need to wrap up. We are rather behind schedule. Um, I'm happy that we don't have anyone waiting for, um, you know, our room, but we still need to respect people's time. That may mean that people are about to cut out right now. Um, but the next thing we need to worry about is getting Stefan set up with his uh, presentation. Um, but just noting, yeah, we are going to run over. Um, a kind reminder to check in with the blue sheets um, in the Etherpad notes while we transition. Um, I think I learned something from the last setup, which is maybe I can share my screen, but I need to do it with uh, without doing full screen. So let me actually try that. I'm going to go on mute while I do. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, so um, I have uh, difficulties with my setup, so I'm using my phone. I hope the sound is good. And now I'm trying to share, which doesn't work uh, great. Okay, um, so maybe I'll just talk uh, for uh, like 10 minutes. Um, so I prepared some, uh, some slide, I can uh, share it on the, on the chat also. Um, so uh, just give me uh, one minute, okay. Um, so it's a Google Docs. Uh, the slides uh, the slides are on the data tracker, but uh, you can uh, I, I updated a, a little bit the slides uh, this morning. Um, so here it is if you want to follow. So uh, okay, Mallory, can, do you share your screen or? So I'm trying. Are you able to see it now? No. All right, the same problem as before, I hate to say. Somebody else who has presented before uh, could could share them for you. Um, they're on, well, you've given the Google Doc link, but they're also on the um, uh, data. Yeah, the, I, the Google link is slightly updated. Um, um, I, I can do that uh, if you'd like. Gurshabad here, sorry. I don't see them yet. I appreciate that. I can see them now. Thanks, Gershabad. Okay, good. Uh, so I'll tell you when to change them, uh, Gershabad. So, uh, so I'll present an update of a draft association. Um, so my first, my name is Stéphane Couture. I'm a professor in communication studies at the University of Montreal. Uh, so I'm uh, involved with HRPC, uh, let's say, as part of my research. My research overall is interested by, uh, let's say, uh, activists, social activists who are engaged in uh, technological making. And as part of this research, uh, I got interested by ITF and um, I, IETF. So I'm doing a bit of a participant observation, a, a bit like Corinne is doing. But uh, this work with draft association is kind of my way to contribute to the to the to um, HRPC, and uh, well, uh, my contribution is still limited, as I will uh, tell you later. Uh, 
but I'm giving you an update on the on the draft association uh, right now. So can you turn the slide? Okay, so uh, some background, draft association is one of the specific uh, rights draft after uh, 82, RFC 82 or 80. The RFC that was published, initially published uh, by um, HRPC, uh, it's uh, specific to rights of association and assembly. So uh, Gushabad will present another draft just after. Uh, so this this is one of the drafts. There, there's maybe uh, four or five other drafts uh, that are uh, sleeping or active right now. Um, so Niels and Gisela were the original authors. So, uh, and uh, I think last year, uh, Joe, um, Joe and myself, Stefan, uh, took over Israel World at, uh, I think, IETF uh, 104 or 105. So from what I understand, it's a normal process to, uh, to end over the editorship. So the paper is not a, a one author paper, but it's really the research group uh, paper, which poses uh, also other challenges. Um, so because of lack of time, we didn't first uh, much, really much on this, but uh, in the last ITF in December 2019, we proposed a way forward articulated around three meetings seminar that took place in the last month. So can, next slide, please. Uh, so just to give a summary of the draft so people don't know about it. Uh, so the research question is how does the architecture of the internet enable or inhibit the right of freedom of association and assembly? And it's articulated, so you have the table of contents uh, on the right, it's articulated about a brief literature review that I try to enhance a little bit. And uh, seven, uh, what we call the protocol cases, so we look at different protocols and uh, look at how they uh, enable or inhibit the right to freedom of assembly and association. Um, next slide, please. So what has been done since uh, December? Uh, so Joe, Joe uh, didn't have much time about this, so he formally, like, formally resigned from the process. Uh, so I was by myself to lead this process. Melinda agreed to help on RFC manipulation uh, to help me just to uh, like uh, work with XML and make files and GitHub uh, in late February. And I submitted a version four with uh, bare changes in March. Uh, so, uh, um, so basically what we've done and we organized three meetings to discuss the draft. Uh, we advanced uh, quite a bit on like discussions and formulations and new uh, perspectives, but uh, so far little advancements have been done on the text itself since version uh, two that was made by uh, Gisela and Niels. Uh, just some specific of the discussions we had, uh, we reviewed uh, the aim, uh, so formulation of a new uh, broad aim, uh, but softer also. Uh, so before it was testing the relationships between protocols and association. Now it's more softer, like addressing the relationships, seeing what could be the relationships instead of uh, establishing a hard uh, link between the two. We also discussed finer modalities of association that could be taken in consideration. I will present this later. Uh, we. Uh, I've been enhancing the literature review, which I will present also later. And finally, with, we also discussed in our last meeting about the decision process to adopt the draft. Um, it, 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 is it still by consensus or should we go for another simpler, simpler, simpler way? Something that Avery will address later in the meeting. Uh, next slide, please. So, so for one of the big thing I did uh, was uh, to uh, look a bit more about the literature review uh, because the literature review it was more it was more of a theoretical framework if I'd say we we cited some like concepts and theoretical uh, basis but uh, what I feel was lacking is like uh, looking at uh, existing documents that were addressing uh, the right the right to assembly with uh, digital technologies and, if possible, uh, internet protocols. 
So uh, I'd like to show you two documents we found. One is a, a UN document, so it's um, like annual report from the Special Rapporteur of uh, Freedom of Assembly and Associations, uh, which uh, since I think two years is looking uh, more uh, precisely on digital technologies uh, and is, uh, is doing, uh, is mentioning, for instance, in this document that uh, the rights to peaceful assembly and association has become largely dependent on different things, but uh, including policies, technical standards, and algorithms can affect these freedoms. So there's a sensibility about how technical standards affect freedom of association, but it's not really digged out in, in this, uh, this document yet. But I, I feel it would be good to uh, enter in dialogue with this. So one of the proposals I have is in the next ITF, it would be good to invite the special rapporteur. I saw he's uh, doing um, a lot of, he's attending a lot of uh, like middle range meetings. Uh, so it would be realistic to invite him to engage in the discussion. Um, but uh, there's this document that we started to include and we look forward to include in the draft. Next slide, please. Another one document uh, that we found in our literature review is a report from the Council of Europe. Uh, so I made a screenshot of the draft report, but the report has been uh, formally published in which they identify the different cases of uh, like how um, uh, the relationship between uh, internet and um, freedom of assembly and association. So I shared it on the list and uh, it could be interesting, but though we have still discussion about if we should look at these, uh, what I call social cases in the draft, but it could be good to enhance the, uh, the literature review. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, one thing we also did is uh, in the identifying finer, actually it's more uh, discussing finer modalities of association. So we, uh, so the draft as it is right now is like, uh, uh, how can I say, it's mostly saying like, is this uh, protocol enhancing or inhibiting uh, the, uh, uh, the freedom of association, but we, we thought about looking more in which ways uh, it is inhibiting on enhancing association. So uh, based on some philosophical thinking, uh, one, especially one article uh, published by the Stanford and Encyclopedia on Philosophy, we found this kind of categories that we could use to uh, enhance the analysis, but so far we didn't enhance on this slide, on this, um, this front. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, one question we could have, let's say, if we have a, a complete lead date to, to look at is like, uh, what about COVID-19? Like, obviously, we didn't talk, talk about the situation when uh, we first wrote, uh, the, when the RG first wrote this draft, but currently the right to physical assembly is severely restrained in many locations. Uh, in, in, for instance, here in Quebec, it's explicitly that the word assembly is forbidden. But uh, as you know, digital networks are playing a crucial role in, uh, in uh, like uh, enabling or maintaining this capacity of assemblings. But uh, video conferencing apps like Zoom have been much criticized, especially for uh, privacy concerns. Is there anything more we can say about COVID-19 in the draft association? That's the questions I, I have right now. So I put here, there's a section of a, a video conferencing which address, uh, already address privacy issues and, and stuff like this. So is it possible to enhance this? That's an open question I would have here. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so uh, to finish, uh, to conclude this, uh, that's a very quick uh, presentation. My perspective on this, uh, so far I consider myself as an interim lead editor, so I volunteer to, uh, to help on this, but uh, with consideration that I would be kind of second to someone else who knows the process and who will lead this, and I will bring, like, contribute to some stuff, but 
uh, because of the difference, the context, I kind of uh, find myself as the leader of this project. But I feel I didn't succeed in bringing the draft to another stage. I brought some discussions, but not. I, I am not satisfied about, um, let's say, I didn't bring more text. Uh, so that's a conclusion I have on this. Uh, I would still prefer to have a secondary role if somebody would like to volunteer pass the lead to another person. Uh, uh, like I'm still uh, willing to uh, participate in the project, but also willing to withdraw completely if uh, the research group is thinking it's uh, it will be better. Um, I would say I still have I will have more time this summer between now and August because during the school year, school year it's quite. Uh, it's quite difficult for me to put time on this, but during the summer is more easy, but still I need an active partner on content, not only on technical help. So it's a call for volunteer here I'm doing. Uh, one big question I'm still struggling, and it was asked by Corinne on the list, what exactly do we want people to gain from this draft? Uh, so apart from discussing uh, like, uh, a very broadly the relationships between assembly and association and internet protocol. So, so my big question is how this draft is contributing to ITF work or where do we want to go with this? And finally, uh, Avery will look at this, but uh, what the adoption process might need to be a bit softer uh, than uh, like full consensus because there's always people like uh, disagreeing with some parts. So we might uh, we might have to clarify the, the adoption process uh, so we know where we are going with this. So I'll stop with this. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, this has been really useful. And I would just agree with something Niels wrote in the chat, which is to not underestimate the progress we've made. I think it's good. I think we can do more. And that is what we can try to discuss just a little bit right now. Um, I would just add that we should go back to the list and if this is a call to action for people who want to contribute to this is please try to answer Corinne's question. Um, what do we want people to get from this draft? That would be a very useful discussion to have in parallel to some of the work items on this draft that you've identified. Anyone else want to jump in the queue? Are there no are there no responses or suggestions? I have my hand raised, Mallory, if I may. Oh, sorry, I can't see that. Go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Niels from the University of Amsterdam. Thanks so much, Stefan, for all the work you put in. I do think actually you have done a lot of work because a lot of the comments and I've reread the uh, the strong issues had that we had led at the last call for consensus were about uh, the statements that were made about the nature of the relationship, of causality and correlation, etc. And I think you addressed those. Corinne also made a couple of points about those as well. So I think with that, we could perhaps uh, produce a uh, what we called in the previous interim meeting about this document, a minimum viable product. Because I don't think we should have, we should let perfect be any of the good. I think we have spent as a uh, research group now about three years with this document. And I'm not sure if we are going to redesign it, where it's going to be better. I think it would be great if we would have more work. So perhaps we could also like try to push this or leave this behind us instead of just trying to, to go around in circles. And because we all put quite some work in it, I'd say, why don't we try to push it and see where it goes and then continue? But that also might fold in with the discussion later. Thanks. Okay, so with that, I would just suggest we move on to the next part of our agenda. Um, so that means, Gershabad, you are already queued up. Um, you just need to swap over to your slides, and we're going to talk about draft guidelines. Thanks. 
Yep, I uh, hope the slides are visible. So uh, the draft guidelines is uh, being edited by uh, me and Niels right now. And uh, just some context it is that it's, uh, for hum uh, it's a document for human rights guidelines, very closely based on what RFC 8280 did. And it's just an update. Uh, it'll serve as an update to that document. Uh, the uh, last update um, basically added, uh, s s uh, elaborated on uh, some of the questions that were in the guidelines, especially in the connectivity section, but they didn't have uh, 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 an explanation already uh, on why those questions are important. And there was only one review, uh, a human rights review after, or input on the draft after uh, the last update, and that was by uh, Karan and uh, in his review of the uh, st serving stole, uh, stale data uh, in DNS responses. And that was about the weight the document status carries as a signal to developers and engineers about uh, how mature the technology is and uh, whether sh they should deploy it. And consequently, sort of the scale of impact the protocol will have, and then uh, some editorial changes. Uh, there's some work I still need to uh, do on my own, which is uh, there are several other places where uh, the guidelines need uh, is something uh, you'll see in the next version. And uh, this one uh, to me very complicated issue that was brought up in the mailing list, but I still haven't addressed in the draft, which is on the attribution question, which is uh, since everyone has a right to due process and to legal challenge, uh, John Curran suggested that we address the question in the draft about how protocols can have elements um, that can attribute, uh, let's say, a message or some information to a particular user. And this obviously has a conflict with anonymity, pseudonymity, privacy, and uh, uh, freedom of expression, but uh, I, I didn't sense any consensus in the document. I'm happy to hear thoughts on how uh, people would like this addressed in the document. Um, I, I, I can bump the thread after uh, this meeting so that everyone uh, has a fresh uh, look at those issues. Uh, yes, and uh, how you can help in the development of the draft is uh, review the draft if you already haven't. Uh, if you're uh, reviewing any other draft from this uh, uh, perspective and you're using the guidelines, uh, please tell us what guidelines were useful, what was not useful. Do you think there are guidelines that should be in the draft that are uh, that already aren't? Uh, I'm uh, uh, personally, I'm I'm uh, not. Uh, I, I mean, looking for publication at this moment. I think it's uh, completely fine if this document like lives on for much longer as it just uh, uh, and, and develops over time since we're not having many uh, reviews at this stage. Uh, but yes, uh, Niels, hope I, I didn't miss anything that you had in mind. And I'd also love to hear your thoughts on the last question about uh, the document. Thanks, Goshabad, also for the brevity. Um, and just to reiterate, yes, please do bump that thread that John raised. Um, I think hmm. it's an interesting question, and it would be good if we could get more comments on that particular point, because um, it's a sticky one. Anyone else want to jump in? I can't see um, hands raised. I've tried. There's nothing that indicates that to me. Sorry. Yeah, please. Hi, so this is Neil Stenhofer, University of Amsterdam. So what I, uh, I actually, so we had this discussion with the Tao, with the Dow of IETF as well. Like, shall we just keep it fresh on the website or shall we keep pushing new versions of the RFC? With the Dow, we actually chose to completely move it to the website and keep newer versions there. But we're getting a lot of requests for people to have actually the recent updated version as an RFC. And also because uh, RFCs, then it's clear for people what the latest version is. 
And uh, uh, I think there is quite some changes between RFC 80 to 80 and guidelines. Uh, and I do think the guideline, guidelines is a much shorter and more accessible document. And I think it has been road tested way more than RFC 80 to 80. So I think we could also publish it. I think it would be useful. I definitely think it would hurt anyone. And I think it is something that we worked on as a group and uh, that is a useful contribution also, Fenwick said. So I'd say, why not? And uh, then if we really find changes that it is an RFC, doesn't mean we cannot keep on working on it, right? We can post updates and make a new RFC. So I don't think we should be too afraid uh, to publish stuff, but that's just my opinion. Anyone have thoughts on that specifically? It'd be good to hear feedback on that proposal. I have thoughts on that. This is Aubrey, but they kind of run to into the next thing I, I you know, I was going to talk about. So, you know, I can wait or I can get into that. Do those specifically apply to the guidelines document? Um, well, the the one thing that that. I, I would question is, and perhaps I'm one of those that, that would be considered afraid to publish too often too quickly. And, but, but I, I do agree that if there is an agreed sentiment within the group that, that this is the time to publish it, I think that is a good reason to do it. I'm not so sure I subscribe to the, oh, why not publish it? Uh, thought on it, but certainly if if the group thinks that this is the time to do a publication because it is shorter, because it is more developed, because it has more evidence and and case, you know, study as it were, then um, it would seem a good idea to consider publishing it. So, but, but I, I guess I don't consider it a matter of fear of, of publishing and and I sort of worry about why not publish as a reason to publish? Thanks. So yeah, my view is as long as people who may be in a position where they need to write a human rights consideration section of a draft know that this guideline document exists, in, even if it's not yet an RFC, that they can use it and, and then hopefully, ideally, they also send us feedback on how useful it is. I'm fine with it as it is, like Gershapan, I agree with that. What I think is important is that eventually it does, you know, become a useful enough document that it then is published and sort of becomes that guideline document. But if it's doing that job already in its current state, I think it's fine. Um, but at some point it'd be good to know, like, okay, yeah, we think that this is useful enough and we've worked out all the thorny issues, so let's just do it. Um, but yeah. Anyone else in the queue? All right. So we have our last agenda item with about seven minutes left. I really apologize for the poor time management, but also there weren't very strong restrictions like, please get out of this very well air conditioned room immediately. Um, so it was a bit, um, we were able to, we were able to get away with being lazy on that. Uh, so, Avery, it's yours. Okay. Um, hopefully, I can be heard. I even turned on my camera, but if my bandwidth starts to waver, I don't presentation. I sent a note to to the list uh, last night my time, uh, which may have already been today for some of you. Uh, basically, discussing the issue of publication, going somewhat into the um, sort of discussion we've had ongoing about um, what gets put out, what gets published as an RFC, you know, and, and basically in that, we really have a choice of either Mallory and I as chairs deciding that yes, something is ready for publication or the group, the research group, as as a as a group, you know, coming to a general uh, agreement that something is ready for publication. Now, I tend to go for the second. 
I know there's an issue with the term consensus because to many people that means that everything in the document is agreed to, and that's certainly never the meaning that I've had for it, but that there was general agreement as opposed to using the rough consensus term, that the document as a whole was ready for publication. Now, we can continue to discuss and refine that, and I think that that's fine. But what I was really looking at is that, that there's more going on uh, in a lot of the, the, the areas just what might be appropriate for a research group RFC effort. I think association, by the way, is thing that is perfect for an, an RFC uh, effort, and so I hope we keep it on that one. So what I started looking at is there's a lot of people that make a lot of contributions. There's a certain, if something's not going to get published, then why are you doing it thought of, you know, there's a lot of work to write something. There's a lot of effort that goes into comment and editing and fixing. So why aren't we just publishing? And wondering whether it made sense for us to come up with a separate parallel publication track of things that were well considered, that, that sort of held on a theme or a focus. And I was looking at it yearly, but somebody did say, you know, accurately, why yearly? Why not just periodically? And sure, nothing in this proposal is is more than just an initial idea. But that basically, we pick a theme for a, a collection, um, you know, and I suggested two and two possible ones in note. Um, and then basically, as any collection, any aggregated uh, group of articles, common research descriptions, we produce the possible uh, volume that we can as as editors working contributors and put something out that basically needs to go through an editorial process but does not follow the general guidelines of RFEs or IRTF uh, RFC publications but is something that would make a good journal, would make a good ebook, would make a good wiki site. I've, I've not gotten the point of suggesting that we can do it in any particular way, but basically looking at that. So what I wanted to start doing is sort of float the idea, see what people thought, have already gotten some, you know, some helpful suggestions and what looks like support for the idea, but it's an idea that would really only work if there were a number of people that said, yeah, that's good, yeah, I would contribute to that, yeah, I would like to see it. Now, what I, and I'll stop quite quick, one of the things that, that I suggest is if there is any support for the idea, you know, what would possibly float is, is a slightly more detailed description, perhaps a, a, a plan for, for how we would do it, and perhaps a little bit of discussion on the list about what would be a topic that people would like to contribute uh, well-considered pieces to, but that therefore we would not be in this, do we have research group agreement on publishing, but rather an editorial team that, that has Mallory and I and other volunteers in it deciding that yes, this is uh, ready to become an ebook, let's say, or if we could find a journal that would give us a, a you know, invited edition or something. So it's an idea of starting to look at, would love to hear, you know, uh, comments on it, ideas for it, and just want to see if it's something that we should really consider doing. Thanks. Thanks, Audrey. This is Corinne. Um, yeah, um, thanks, Ari, for, for raising that. I think the issue of, of publication and how to do it and also how, how to get the HRPC work out um, has been one that's been contentious over the last couple of years. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting in having a non-RFC track is that whatever is published there might also be more accessible to people who are not used to the IETF format. 
which for all intents and purposes is, is not necessarily as intuitive um, as most of us who've been involved in the work for a long time tend to think. Um, the one thing that I think we need to um, sort of consider in advance is what are the incentives for people um, to publish in this way, uh, given that, you know, there's people in HRPC who are academics, who work for companies, who work for etc. So I think one of the things that would be interesting to do is get a little bit more data on whether people are going to do it and what kind of incentives it would take to get them to do the work, considering that we're already running into capacity problems um, as is before a lot of people put a lot of work into the nitty gritty of figuring out what a non RFC track would look like. I think it's good to, to have a little bit more of a sense of the data around do we do people have the capacity and the interest to do it um, right now. Thanks, Corinne. Uh, Stefan, you've got something in the chat um, which folks can read. You could briefly reiterate it, but I wanted to ask you a follow up on point number three. Because um, I'm not quite sure I understand that proposal, but I would love to hear more about what you mean. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, I hope you are me. Um, so, uh, okay, so I agree with Corinne. Uh, like, we could have more input about how people would like to. Uh, to, to contribute. I'll see like three ways based on my little experience I have with this, so, but uh, the RFC track as we do now, uh, but I would also consider uh, something like a really light publication because I feel there are a lot of people here that can, uh, that have really interesting uh, thoughts and uh, so uh, just a blog with indiv individual contributions and we can have a uh, editorial role, like with the chairs, they just approve the blog and it, it doesn't engage much. Uh, uh, just do not have offensive stuff in this and uh, like basic uh, like editorial. But then I would also say an agreement maybe with an academic journal. I'm taking a internet policy review, for instance, or something like this. Uh, that uh, um, that. Uh, it, so uh, we can have some publication like in a peer review. Uh, journal that is coming from the research group. So ideas like I feel there's a lot of academics here uh, that are interested by this group, and uh, like we could use this group as a as a basis to produce some academic work and like uh, recognize uh, HRPC. But um, academics they need like the initiative of peer review. Okay, otherwise it cannot be a priority for for us to, to contribute. Uh, so if there is a way to have peer reviewed articles, uh, that would be a good, at least a good incentive to uh, for academics actually. So that's it. Okay. I ask a separate follow up question to you, but any other academic, uh, which is that um, if if you like why would you want to publish stuff here if you could go ahead and try to publish it yourself in another academic journal like what would be the incentive um or if there is one and maybe that's the sort of question that you're asking corinne yeah i'll say because they are cool people in this space so i i would like you know there are interesting discussions going on and it's an interesting space so it's good to have collaboration here, but like publishing in ITF is not a, uh, like it doesn't count as the same thing as a like academic peer review journal. Uh, so uh, that that's how I understand it. So maybe Karin can add to some to this, but I mean I fully agree. I think especially as a as a as an early stage academic um, from the perspective of what do I need to get tenure track? There is very little incentive for me to publish within HRPC because it, unfortunately, it doesn't count professionally. Um, that being said, I mean, many of the academics who are present here are very interested in both following, but also making a, an impact on policy conversations. Um, so depending on what kind of an academic you are and how focused you are on, on doing engaged research, um, I, do, I do think there is an incentive there. But, but
but it's a hard one. It's it's really going to be hard to get people to publish here when it, it doesn't have the same kind of rewards that publishing in an academic journal would have. Can I add myself to the queue, Mallory? Just go ahead, please. Thanks. This is Niels. So I think that for me, working in HRPC uh, 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 has a and publishing as RFC has a clear uh, reward because not because I as an academic get graded for it, but, but because it allows me to engage with internet engineers. And there is no lack of, uh, uh, of journals. And I think Stefan and uh, Corinne and others can, uh, uh, can also say this, that want our articles about the IETF. There are a lot of journals that find our work on the IETF and other internet governance stuff very interesting, but um, why I think many of us are here are to engage interdisciplinarily with, uh, 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 with the engineers. And I think for that, the RFC series is a very useful tool. And I think in the email list discussion, we've also seen that we, that there are different, that we can come up with our own rules to work with the RFCs. So I would strongly prefer that instead of reinventing the wheel, because this reminds me very much of a discussion that we're already having for years within GigaNet, which is the uh, organization for internet governance researchers who tried to have their, who were thinking of setting up their own journal, but it's a lot of work. And then before the journal has a good standing and becomes relevant, it's really hard. And then people go off and uh, publish in the areas where they come from respectively anyhow. So I'm not sure whether with our limited capacity, setting up a journal or a publication stream is the most effective one if, if the thing that we study and that we're working on is the RFC series. Thanks, Niels. And can you just speak to why it needs to be an RFC for you to have that interface with the technical community? Like, you could come and, like you have done, right? Like a lot of your publications, this isn't just an abstract conversation for you, it's real. So like, you've been drafting documents, you've been having those conversations, um, and what is the difference for you to have it an RFC when because it's being done under the auspices of the research group like you already get that discussion can you just highlight the difference for you well i think that none of the work from hrpc has has been as influential and as widely referenced and as rfc 80 to 80. and that is because when something gets to rfc level it gets way more exposure in the whole ietf irtf community for good or for bad, but it invokes a lot of discussion. Even one RFC got its own human rights uh, research, uh, uh, research uh, human rights considerations section. So it really worked and did something. And as we all know, we almost have 9,000 RFCs. Many of them are forgotten and not implemented, but they definitely sell, say a lot more than a random email on a mailing list or an internet draft. So I do think that RFCs are the tools for uh, uh, for discussion and uh, 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 and also markers in the internet infrastructure themselves. So that's why I think they are definitely useful as we've been working on them since the first one got published uh, uh, about three decades ago or 25 years. Just to note, there's a side uh, chat. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. I just wanted to jump in a second and, and thank people for the comments. You know, I don't know when we're going to because we are now way over time. But um, I wanted to point out that, that nothing is talking about getting rid of the, the, the RFC. Um, you know, I think one of the things we saw in the chat was sort of this description of people talking about the RFC starting to get accepted in some academic institutions as a, a viable publication because of the rigor and uh, peer review process of its own that it does go through, which I think for me is often one of the reasons why uh, I, I'm 
have such pains to look for a general agreement for publication of the document, not agreement necessarily with all issues, but for publication as we did with 8280. Not everybody agreed with everything in it, but everybody agreed that it was time to publish. So that's, that's kind of my read for, part of my reason for wanting to hang on to a certain amount of strictness. But I also think there is great value in getting other ideas, ideas that people haven't had a long argument discussion on out in sort of an aggregated volume. I understand the difficulties and I, and um, as I say, I'm just at the beginning of looking at that. Uh, I, I did follow the, the Gannett um, uh, attempts to, to do that. One of the things that I think may be of value that is different from just getting published in another journal or a journal that's specific area is that it can be sort of concentrated and branded as a specific piece of aggregated work, collected work, in the specific topic that, that's related. Somebody pointed out that there's really also no barrier that sort of said something that starts out in one track can't hop to the other track if, if that ends up good. So really not looking at all, Niels, to, to, to replace um, the, the, the RFC work and, and hoping that continues, but, but looking to try and add something else and, and and such. One of the things that was also mentioned is, you know, sort of the difficulty that a lot of people find in doing internet drafts. You know, for me, this is the third time I've had to learn to do an internet draft from, you know, throughout the history of, of RFC. And they are very strict. And, and I do believe that for many people, they are an initial barrier. And so was looking that if we do work on a parallel track, that it would work more on the sort of standard forms of documents that people use with, with uh, you know, journals or eBooks or what have you, uh, that, that do not have that initial barrier to, to start. So often I've heard from people working on things that, you know, I just find the internet draft you know, methodology, difficult. And while it's easy for the IETF engineers, it's not necessarily easy for the other people we want to bring in, the, the advocates and, and, and the academics. So I really thank people for their comments. I'd really like to continue discussing it on the list to see if there's enough people that think it's worth taking the next baby step, which is to come up with a plan and, and if that plan is at all acceptable to people as something to move ahead on. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, and I think we want to wrap up just to respect everyone's time and appreciate that everyone is stick, stuck around for 45 minutes over. I would say just to like finish up this, this point, um, it does feel like a plan needs to be in place. So if that means following up on IPR and asking them if they would, you know, allow us to do a special issue or have some kind of relationship, um, or if there are, you know, maybe the academics who've been so helpful with suggestions and feedback on this, if we can um, have a bit of a discussion about it on the list with some actionable follow-up, then we can come up with a plan, but actually uh, like some kind of process, because right now it's a proposal and for it to be actionable, we need something uh, something specific. And I just wanted to say that from uh, just for myself, um, I I struggle to see how it doesn't reinvent the wheel, and how you know folks who want to publish could just go ahead and already do that. I don't know how HRPC facilitates that or makes it any better or attractive for folks to do that here, um, other than the community, which I think um, is maybe Niels's point, but I see that, I'll, I see the interface with the community existing from the time the internet draft is published. I do think it's true um, that having an internet draft in the data tracker, as onerous as that is, 
is the way to get those conversations going in the IETF and the IRTF, just because that is, you know, those are the tools that we work with. That's the community that we're that we're talking to. And and I think that those are matters that are logistical and surmountable with support. Um, I know that writing an internet draft is not easy in terms of formatting, but I also had experience as an undergrad using latex, which is a total pain in the ass and often required by journals and at least in STEM. So um, yeah, I think we just need more on that. Um, and again, just really appreciate everyone's extra time um, and expertise on this. Uh, we will hopefully be able to share the recording of this meeting um, and the notes will be forthcoming. Please, please, please make sure your name is on the note, uh, which is essentially our blue sheets. Um, anything else I'm forgetting? You know, stay healthy, stay well, stay home. Thank you. Big hugs. Okay, bye for now, everybody. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Mallory, Mallory, may I, add, may I add one thing? Yeah, it hopes. I think this was great to have this interim meeting. The previous interim meeting was also very productive, but I really like this format. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that feedback. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Bye, everybody. <laughs>